Okay, so uh, 19th century industrial architecture. And um, earlier we had, I, I talked a little bit about the um, architecture of the 18th century and the 1700s. And I talked a little bit about how, you know, the origins of the Industrial Revolution began in the 1700s. We talked about the salt works at show um, and a few other sort of dreamy uh, design ideas that were completely impractical, uh, certainly in that time. Um, but that um, um, we're going to start to see those kinds of things could be built now. You know, it, it, the technologies are going to start catching up to the imagination that architects uh, have had for a long time, and they could actually implement some of the things that they were dreaming of. So the Industrial Revolution really kicks off. I mean, it really goes full throttle uh, starting in the 19th century. And this, this is a radical, radical change really in the world, in, in, worlds, in the world culture, uh, and, it, and it has an impact on just about every aspect of our life and culture as humans, um, including architecture, which of course is what we want to talk about. Um, it, it really radically transformed people's lives. Um, we went from a societies that were based on rural, a living on agriculture, on you know, sort of making uh, the things that you used yourself, on uh, bartering system where you would trade, you know, pigs for or something like that, uh, and it create and it created a, a a system in which people had jobs in which they had a regular work schedule, you know, eight to five or whatever, uh, where they. Um, urban life, um, factories, and, and, um, and the ability to, to buy things. Um, to, to, you know, if you needed something, it was made in a factory rather than by hand or by yourself, and then you just bought it. Uh, but to buy it, you needed money. Uh, and so you had to, um, uh, the, the bartering system that was used uh, heavily throughout most of world history um, was no longer applicable. And we're going to talk a little bit in a future lecture about the uh, some of the um, the backlash against this these changes. You know, people don't people don't expect accept change very well. Humans tend to sort of resist that in many ways, um, and we'll see some backlash against these um, massive changes and developments that the industrial revolution creates. Um, but speaking more specifically about architecture, um, we see a, a, a just a massive fundamental shift in architecture. Everything we have been talking about from the fall semester up till now has really been about, um, you know, materials like wood and stone, maybe even adobe, uh, which, you know, essentially constructed like masonry. Uh, we've seen very simple structural systems beams and arches and columns. Uh, we, you know, when we talked about the Romans, they developed the ideas of vaulting and domes that then were used or reused, you know, later on and early in the semester with the Renaissance and the Baroque. Uh, but they're all these fundamental principles that go back, you know, millennia. Uh, but starting in, in the 1800s with the Industrial Revolution, we get brand new materials and uh, materials that can can do things that these fun, you know, these these fundamental materials and technologies never could. Uh, that we can make things bigger, we can make them taller, we can make them wider, uh, we can create massive spaces, we create new things that need new types of architecture um, that we'll be talking a little bit about. Uh, and this is especially true with cast iron, which was um, really going to be one of the major focuses that we'll talk about today: the the development and the impact of cast iron on architecture as we see here. So there's a photo of this. Uh, we'll be talking about this bridge here in a moment. So cast iron um, was just a, a, a fundamental revolution. Um, it, it was quickly obvious that it had some significant architectural advantages. And then later, it, it was determined that it had some disadvantages as well. Uh, but fundamentally, cast iron is a very strong material in compression. Just like stone, you know, stone or masonry, you can stack it on top of each other. You can really load it very, very heavy, uh, and it can support that weight above it. Um, but it was then, you know, determined, uh, just like stone or masonry, that it's actually pretty weak 
in tension or bending. And so, you, you know, if you want to create a, a beam, uh, that beam is, um, you know, a wood beam is pretty good in tension like that, in tension loading. But uh, stone isn't, you know, you make a stone beam too wide and it'll just crack and fall down. And so, you know, to, to solve that, uh, ancient architects figured out how to vault or how to arch uh, to create uh, that span, but using the principles of compression that uh, stone or masonry was good with. And the same thing applies essentially to cast iron. And that later on, we're going to talk about the development of you know, steel and uh, concrete, which have you know, um, different principles and advantages to cast iron. Did you have a question, Eileen? Or Oh, okay, great. Uh, so, um, so we really see, uh, uh, and and cast iron, you know, with with these advantages, even though it has similar properties to masonry, to stone, and so forth, um, because Sorry, it's fundamentally my different. Uh, bogus. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Okay, I think everybody else can hear me. Okay, right? No, yeah, it's it's definitely just me. Um, but I was just okay. making sure you knew that I was here. Okay, yeah, I see you. Thank you. So, um, you know, cast iron can, uh, modifying how you use it, uh, could really do something bigger and grander than masonry ever could, as we'll see here, I think, uh, shortly. So the first thing I want to talk about is uh, the Iron Bridge at the River Severn. Uh, this is in Shropshire, England, uh, and it dates from 1777, finished in 1781. So we're still actually in the 18th century. Like I said, this, you know, the early manifestation of the Industrial Revolution starts in the 1700s. And this is significant because this is the first cast iron bridge to be built, uh, the first real structure to use this pretty new material of cast iron as a building material. And as we'll see, it was initially used for structures, for, for bridges. Uh, the architects, or the, the people behind this, um, is Thomas Pritchard and Abraham Darby III. So Abraham Darby III was the grandson of Abraham Darby the Elder that we see uh, on the photo here. And uh, Abraham Darby the Elder, is quite significant because he is essentially the one who who discovered this process of creating cast iron um, and um, you know people knew about you know iron ore that you know you could dig out of the ground and that if you heat it up and, and mold it and stuff you could create, kind of create something but uh, the old ways of heating this uh, just weren't intense enough you know wood or charcoal or something like that just doesn't produce a hot enough fire and his discovery was that if you burn coal uh, you could create a very very hot intense heat and that higher temperature uh, melting the iron ore could create a very strong uh, result the, uh, uh, that is essentially cast iron. And when I talk about cast iron, just so you're clear, we're talking about you take that melted iron ore and you pour it into a mold and then let it cool. Um, and this is different than the way we make steel, both the way we heat it and treat it, but also steel nowadays, uh, or modern steel, is extruded typically, uh, where you run it through to create a shape for it. Uh, but cast iron is literally uh, casted in like a sand mold, and then you know you have this piece left over. So uh, he created this process, or invented it, discovered it, and you know began this you know manufacturing process for for cast iron and so in 1750 or in the 1770s um his grandson uh, darby the third you know he's running this factory uh, he's making cast iron and he's you know decides to work with um, pritchard to figure out how to do something with it i mean you know like any manufacturer they have this product and they want to sell more of it so he's like well what can we do <laughs> uh, how can i how can i you know uh, expand my own market this is a painting of uh, the, the actual Colebrookdale furnace um, uh, showing, uh, and I, I like to show this because it really shows you the cultural change that the Industrial Revolution causes here, you know, where, where we just have these factory buildings and massive, you know, hot fires that, that's, you know, 
emit uh, large amounts of you know what we would later determine to be pollution uh, and heat and and all of that a completely different kind of uh, scene than a rustic rural uh, farmstead. Here's an image of the factory in the cast iron process. They're they're heating up some of the iron ore and you know rolling it and doing things to to in order to create these different elements and so forth. Thomas Pritchard, um, <laughs> uh, interestingly, uh, is an architect who would have otherwise never been talked about <laughs> by, by anyone other than his descendants or something. Um, he had, you know, like probably most people in the world, right? You know, you kind of go about your life, you do your thing, and um, but you don't get written about in the history books um, and certainly don't get talked about, you know, hundreds of years later in uh, an architectural history class. Uh, but he um, he was kind of a dreamer, like we were seeing with Claude Ledoux and the others uh, in one of the earlier lectures in the eight, in the 1700s, and he was imagining uh, this new material. He was really fascinated with this cast iron material, and um, really thought about the different ways that perhaps it could be used. Uh, and these are actual drawings that he did um, in the 1770s of bridges using cast iron. Um, the one in the middle, I think, is maybe my favorite. Um, it's using, you know, big, you know, huge pieces of cast iron and you cut little holes out in order to make it a little bit lighter uh, in weight. Uh, and you would connect it maybe at the middle. And it's really showing essentially a stone bridge, right? I mean, this is this is basically a masonry arch and he's, he's creating uh, the same type of bridge construction that you would in stone, but you're, he's doing it in uh, cast iron. The one on the top is sort of interesting. It's more of a truss-like um, creation, uh, but the one on the bottom is pretty close to what would ultimately be built at the River, River Severn. So here's an image of it. And you can see it, it, there's definitely a bit of a hybrid going on here. There are stone buttresses that provide you know, the vertical support and even a little bit of buttressing. But the actual span over the river is a, a cast iron system um, that um, you know, allows them to support a roadbed on top. And there's even little uh, wrought iron you know, railings along the top here so people don't fall off the bridge. Here's another view uh, showing a little bit more um, even even one of the ends is a more traditional stone arch. And what I like to show this image because you see the comparison. Here is a, a relatively wide arch vault, right? Just a simple Roman barrel vault. And that would easily allow a carriage and people to walk and pass through or under. Um, but to try to use that same material and the same technology to span this wider river, would be very difficult. Generally, let me show you this image here to give you a better sense of the span of this. And this is not a huge river by any means. Uh, you know, it's not the Mississippi or something, but it's still wide enough that if you were doing this in stone, you would wind up having to put at least one, maybe more piers in the river and have shorter masonry arches in order to, to fully span this. Um, because remember, when you're building in, you know, masonry, as we talked about, you, you pretty much have to create the centering, the wood centering, in order to build before you have the arch locked in with the keystone. And so, um, you know, there, there were limits on how wide of a span you could do. But what we see with cast iron here at this initial bridge is that you can create a much wider span without inter any intermediate supports. And the advantage to that is that now you have a clear channel, right? The boats that would pass by on the river don't have to worry about crashing into the pier uh, or slipping through a narrow channel or narrow opening in the, in the stone bridge. Now they have the full width of the river to pass under. And, and, and the ideas and principles that are built here at a relatively narrow river uh, will apply to wider rivers and so the technology just needs to be you know expanded and refined in order to span even wider rivers 
And here's some details of the bridge uh, itself. Uh, Pritchard was was a carpenter. He was you know very experienced in um, wood joinery, and this is somewhat uh, interesting because he used those that understanding to uh, to join the pieces of cast iron together. Uh, so really, it, it's built out of cast iron, but it's built in the way that a carpenter would construct something like this, uh, which um, initially is, you know, kind of how things develop. You, you, you know something, you know how to do something, and so you use that knowledge and try to apply it to this new material. Later on, um, the you know they'll start engineers and so forth will will start to figure out how to better connect and work with this new material in ways that are more appropriate to to the material itself uh, but what we see initially is this very fine filigree of pieces and elements that are all joined together with pins and connectors in order to construct this uh, this bridge element all right, so um, you know this, you know, launches. This is in the 1770s, but it launches, you know, a a whole new, you know, effort to start building things using cast iron, and a, an early building type that um, that takes advantage of this material are greenhouses. Um, if you think about a greenhouse, and if you've been to like Garfield Park, the greenhouse there, which is really nice, and I think there's one in Lincoln Park even. Um, you know, it, it's, it needs a lot of glass in order to let light through so that plants will grow. Um, and so you can't really imagine think using a lot of masonry and heavy building materials on that. Uh, you want something that's rather thin and light. And so the same thing that we saw uh, with, the, with the bridge, this sort of fine filigree elements, if you were to, you know, fill in the gaps with glass, uh, you can imagine, I think, pretty readily that it would make a pretty fine greenhouse. And so I want to show you the Palm House at Kew Gardens. This is in England uh, in the 1840s. Uh, I love the name of this guy, Decimus Burton. I think that's another cool name uh, for an architect, Decimus. Uh, so here is the... Uh, the greenhouse uh, or palm house growing palm trees in here and of course the you know here's another radical shift the idea that you could grow a tropical plant in a um, in a climate that has you know relatively harsh winters um, is a is something that the industrial revolution will allow because now you can build a, a building of essentially glass I mean this is uh, it needs the cast iron structure to hold it all together, but it's basically a glass building. Um, and this is something, again, quite radical. Glass is another uh, um, industrial revolution invention. I mean, we, we knew about glass, but you you know, just like cast iron, you had to heat the sand to a very, very high temperatures in order to get it to melt. And then, um, you know, if you're trying, it, usually glass was quite small because it it's easily broken, and if you're trying to, you know, transport it with wagons and so forth, um, you're, it's, it'll be easily broken. But we start to see the technology also to build more and more glass, which we'll see uh, in an extravagant example quite shortly. So here we see that um, there are, you know, heavy structural members like here and here. And then finer mullions for the glass that are just designed to hold the glass in. Um, but the, you know, you can see these thicker members uh, on the sides every so often that create the structural framing for this. And on the inside um, are, you know, this is a this is essentially an arch. So just like the the arch that spans that river that we just saw. Um, you can span this open space. Let's go to the next photo and you can see. You can span that and not have any columns on the interior as well. So you're creating a barrel vaulted space, just like the Romans had discovered, uh, but you're doing it in a way um, with, a, with a brand new material here. And then just the little fine mullions that hold the glass in uh, are not providing any structural element. They're just holding the glass together. And this allows for a big wide open space in which you can hold all the, the plants, all the ferns and, and palms and so forth. 
So um, in 1851, uh, the city of London hosted uh, one of the things that or comes out of the Industrial Revolution, a, a World's Fair. Um, and these were really popular in the 19th and early 20th century. We're going to talk about a couple of them, um, or one more today and, and another one later on, uh, actually several of them, uh, before we're all done this semester. Um, and this was one of the first ones to be held. And it really was an exhibition uh, showing off all of the discoveries and all of the inventions and all of the new machineries and technologies that were being developed around the world. And England was one of the leaders of the Industrial Revolution. They were one of the early adopters of this and, um, and uh, you know, in many rightfully ways, you know, hosted this first great exhibition. But other nations were invited to submit, you know, things that they had done as well. And to host it, uh, they needed a, a big space uh, that would have um, the capacity to hold together all of these you know, machines and equipment and things that were being submitted for the exhibition. And, um, and in many ways, I think the planners of the fair wanted something that would represent, architecturally, that would represent this, this new technologies and this new industrial age. And they were at a loss for, for quite a while, the planners of this. And uh, by happenstance, one of the planners uh, wound up meeting this gentleman, Joseph Paxton. Let me see here. Uh, Paxton was a garden designer, and because of that, he um, began to dabble in greenhouse designs uh, because, you know, they, you know, as we saw uh, with the Kew Gardens there, you needed, uh, if you were creating gardens, luxurious gardens for wealthy clients and the royalty, uh, you needed a place to have more exotic plants, tropical plants that you could hold. So he had already started learning about uh, how to build greenhouses. He was working on perfecting some of the details of how to connect the glass to the iron frame and all of that sort of thing. And so he, you know, he, he had a pretty good expertise at that. And when he met with one of the planners and they were talking about how they needed this big grand space, you know, but it would be so big that no, you know, light wouldn't get into the inner, you know, elements of it and all the challenges they were having. Uh, he came up with this idea and he's like, well, you know, what you're really describing to me is you need a greenhouse. And instead of putting, you know, ferns and palm trees inside, we'll put, you know, industrial equipment and machines and so forth. And right then and there, during the meeting, he sketches up on a piece of scrap paper uh, what he's talking about, and he shows it to the planner and says, this is what you need. And this is literally his sketch from that meeting in which he shows this, uh, this planner of the fair what you know, his idea is to build a, a display hall for this exhibition. And I like to call this, and this is, you know, well known, <laughs> uh, this is like the fam famous napkin sketch. Have you, have you all seen those, you know, um, sometimes you see them in little design competitions or uh, whatever, where you, you know, you just sketch up on napkins or on a little piece of scrap paper, um, you know, idea or a sketch of a building or something like that. And uh, they're kind of famous today, but this is this is maybe the origin of that because he's literally sitting there talking with a potential client, and he sketches up his idea for them. So on the bottom of it, we see the the elevation, and the top is a section through it. So uh, in the section, we see a grand barrel vaulted space, like we might have seen in a great cathedral or. Um, a, a Renaissance church, and then various wings that get a little shorter as you go, and all of it would be um, glazed on the outside, and you'd see, you know, iron arches to, you know, provide that sort of compression support that the iron provides for, and because it's stepped down like this, you can actually get light coming in, almost like clear story windows that we would expect to see in a cathedral church, uh, that that would allow light to penetrate into the heart of the building. Uh, if you were to build this out of stone or masonry, first of all, it would be massively expensive. It would take a long, long time to do, and it would be very, very dark inside. And of course, you know, we haven't yet discovered electric lighting, so um, that comes later in the century. So um, it's necessary still to use natural light. And so, in fact, he gets the commission. 
and he builds what is the Crystal Palace, um, the first great industrial hall or just um, um, exhibition hall of the 19th century from 1851. So here is a rendering view from showing all the people in their top hats and their you know fancy dresses going to the fair. Uh, and you can see the massive, massive scale of this building. It is humongous. Nothing this big had ever really been built before. Um, you know, bigger than St. Peter's Cathedral, which was uh, about the largest building in the world at that time. Certainly bigger than St. Paul's Church in London that uh, Christopher had done. And you can see it's pretty close to the napkin sketch. You know, the outside um, are a bunch of posts with these arches at the top. We see a grand barrel vault space uh, that cuts across and you see all the different steps that would allow for light to penetrate into the depths of the building. And here in this image, this is the first time in the semester, or in, in, especially in last semester and even this semester, that I am showing you a photograph of a building project that is contemporary to that. Um, you know, I've showed you some, you know, obviously photos, I've showed you historic photos uh, of how the building looked, you know, in our past, but this is the first project that I'm showing you in which we actually have a photograph taken when the building was built. Um, so that's how far ahead we have jumped here in, in time. Um, 1851, of course, photography started in the in, uh, 1840s. And you can get a really good sense of the massive scale of this. You can see you know, some people scattered here and there. And this is huge. And it is all in cast iron and glass. And the other advantage to this construction is that um, they can, they can make all of these components, all the cast iron components are very similar and you just mass produce them and then you put them together um, like a, you know, like a stick framed construction, just like we still do today. You know, you, you know, we make, we make the steel elements for a skyscraper and we ship them to the site and there's a crew that just connects them all together. Um, this is a lot different than having to cut stone out of the ground, carve it into shapes, place it, wait for the mortar to dry, uh, build so you could arch it or vault it and all of that. All those things are now gone and you can build this very, very quickly and much, much cheaper, which is going to draw the attention of developers uh, when, you know, when we get to the 20th century. Here is a fur plan. Uh, on the bottom and another um, elevation kind of section view. So the plan was pretty simple. It was just a big rectangle. Um, the the uh, vault here got, goes across, um, was almost like a transept crossing, if we're thinking of it in terms of a church. And there was just a giant hall with some smaller galleries and rooms off to the side. There were quite a few columns necessary for this. Uh, it wasn't all completely vaulted. Um, and that's a reflection of still quite early technologies and building something so massive uh, that they that they still had to build a lot of columns uh, to support the the, the roof framing and structure in this. Uh, but when we get to some of the later um, um, buildings and, and exhibitions, we'll see that um, they're able to span greater and greater widths and lengths uh, to create open, clear spaces. Here is a rendering view of the interior uh, without all the stuff inside. So it's kind of a fantasy view of it, but you can see the sense of this barrel vaulted main atrium. They can even put trees inside of it. Uh, they can have, you know, the staircases and lots and lots of light because this is really just a giant greenhouse. And so I'm sure it would have been hot as heck in the summertime uh, with the sun beaming down and no air conditioning. Uh, but um, they could have had, you know, ventilation and, you know, things, you know, they could have, like greenhouses do, they could open some things up to get some ventilation in here. Here is a, another rendering view of one of the exhibition halls with some of the machinery that was on display, gears and pistons and steam driven things. Uh, and I like showing some of this because then you see the men in their top hats and the ladies with their bonnets and, and so forth. So, you know, you still get to see that this is uh, uh, mid 1800s, uh, even though the uh, equipment and machinery looks quite modern. Here's another actual photograph. This is during the construction. 
uh, there's some guys in their top hats, uh, and you get a, another good sense of the massive scale of this. Uh, so here you see these, you know, cast iron posts. Uh, they're held together a little bit with these arches and some cross beams and some even truss-like elements uh, that support the um, sort of razorback roof of, of glass. Uh, so here, this is a balcony, but you can see it has a glass roof over it, and the glass roof would have also extended over the main hall to let in lots of light. So this, um, you know, this was a one-year exhibition, uh, and then it closed, and they, uh, the City of London kept it. This was in a park, and they said, hey, we can do all kinds of other fairs and festivals and things and host it here. So it actually survived uh, for many, many decades and probably would have kept on going if not for an, an unfortunate thing that befalls so many buildings. Um, in 1936, there was a fire. Uh, and uh, this also <laughs> represents the idea that, or the myth, that cast iron was fireproof. You know, they figured, well, it doesn't burn. Well, it doesn't burn, but if everything else around it inside the building burns, uh, it will heat up to an extent that it will melt the cast iron. And this was discovered um, throughout, and not just moments like this, but even earlier. In fact, during the Chicago fire, a number of buildings that had cast iron facades and frames collapsed during the fire because they melted. And uh, in fact, in the post-fire Chicago, uh, the city all but banned cast iron, or at least required it to be fireproof, to surrounded by masonry, so that it would not overheat and melt and collapse. I cannot tell you what happened to the poor kitties uh, that were <laughs> part of this <laughs> exhibition during the fire. Uh, hopefully, they all got out safely. All right, so here, uh, another example is the Bibliothèque saint Genevieve. This is in Paris uh, from the 1840s, uh, finished by 1850 by architect Henri Le Brost. And I like to show this example because the exterior looks exactly like we've been talking about all along. Um, and this is a good example of the challenges uh, and, and ways that architects addressed this new technology and this new material. What we saw previous were bridges, greenhouses, and a big, you know, a giant greenhouse that would host a industrial fair. Um, but as architects began to apply these new technologies and these new materials to more ordinary buildings, they did not want to necessarily embrace the industrial character, they felt that the architecture should still be something reflective of tradition, uh, the traditional materials, the traditional styles. And so the exterior of this um, library is essentially neoclassical architecture that we were talking about last time. It has, you know, Roman arches, it has pilasters, it has entablatures, it has some of these cool little swags. Uh, it's stone masonry built in the way traditional stone masonry would be built. Um, but a library generally as a functional need um, needed a big open reading hall. Back in the day before you could, you know, down the book on your, on your iPad and read it in your home or your library or your bedroom or whatever, um, you know, you people didn't just check out books. They went to a library and they, they got the book off the shelf and they read it there in, in place. And so they needed giant reading halls uh, and they needed lots of light so that people could actually read the book easily and not hurt their eye. And so um, there was a need for a big open space um, that this new technology of cast iron and the idea of spanning, you know, rivers and, you know, having uh, plants inside could apply to the idea of having, you know, tables and, and chairs for reading. Uh, and around the perimeter or whatever inside, you would have the stacks of books and so forth. And so the interior of this library is the cast iron spanned space, very similar to the same technology that we saw with the bridge or with the greenhouse. Um, again, uh, the technology to span this whole width isn't quite there yet with cast iron, and so they put a row of columns down the center, and so what we really get are two barrel vaults with these 
um, very decorative filigree cast iron trusses essentially uh, and then they can you know use some cast iron frames along to to fill in the here in the case here they don't necessarily need it to be glass and so it's not like a greenhouse per se but the the walls are with these Roman arch stone Roman arch vaults allow for plenty of windows for light to come in to to light the space here's a nice detail of the cast iron and you can see they're trying to make it decorative too uh, in the bridge that we saw uh, it was it was just a bridge and so they just made it quite functional uh, but because this was on the interior of a building uh, the architects and engineers felt that it was necessary to make this a, a decorative an architectural statement not just a structural statement um, but they they leave, leave it exposed you know so often architects will hide the structure right uh in decorative elements but here they they actually left it exposed they just made the structure quite decorative in itself so the next examples i want to talk about are a completely new building type that uh, that comes out of the industrial revolution and that is the train station uh part one of the you know new inventions new machinery of of the 19th century is the railroad and the steam engine or steam locomotive that can you know revolutionize transportation it, no longer do you have to ride a horse or ride a buggy over mud sogged roads that will take you weeks uh, to to get from one end of England to the other um, now you can ride a an iron horse as the Native Americans called it and you can be from one end to England to the other in a matter of just a few hours uh, it revolutionizes you know transportation and the connectivity of people um, in a way that you know was similar to the way the internet connects us in the world today um, or that you can hop on an airplane and be halfway around the world in a matter of a few hours but this new technology needed a new type of architecture uh, to house it. You know, the, the actual station where all the trains come and go and the people can board and so forth uh, needed a, a, a place. And, you know, you, you want to cover the platforms so that people are protected from the weather as they're coming and getting, you know, coming and going from the trains and in a major station, a major hub like King's Cross, um, you need a, a lot of, train lines uh, in, uh, uh, in order to create enough platforms for, for all the trains. And so here we see um, in King's Cross, the, the, um, the, the train platforms are covered in this, these cast iron arches that create essentially a Roman barrel vault over, uh, over the space. Um, they're still using masonry on the sides, you'll notice that, and they have Roman masonry arches uh, to anchor to these larger cast iron arches. But again, look at the size of the Roman arches and the masonry off to the sides there, much, much smaller, not wide enough in order to span and allow for three or four trains at a time uh, within this space. But the cast iron arches are, are, can span a much, much wider breadth that allow for more trains within that. And just like the greenhouses, uh, you could create glass on some of the um, part of the vault in order to let plenty of light in so that people can see as they're coming and going from their train. And if we compare this view with an actual historic view, um, I don't think these are from the 1850s, probably from the late 19th century or early 20th, but uh, it's, you know, hasn't changed very much uh, since that time. We still see um, the, the skylight uh, and, you know, just more different type of train and different type of uh, dress that people are wearing. Here's another view from one of the platforms, and you can very clearly see the masonry construction on the side uh, that helps to anchor and support the cast iron elements uh, spanning the wider platform. And what's also interesting about King's Cross is the exterior expression. Uh, they, they use brick masonry, uh, but they really, this is a, an early example of an architect expressing the, the structure and the use of the space. We're gonna talk later on uh, about Louis Sullivan and the Chicago School about his famous quote, form follows function or form ever follows function. Uh, this, is, this is an early example of that. Um, when you stand outside here, you can, you can literally see inside through the windows that behind are these massive 
iron bolts uh, that you know allow for the trains and you know it's further reflected in the entryways which are smaller arched vaults as well um, this didn't go over very well actually with the english public uh the the general public thought that this was rather ugly uh it didn't conform to their views of what architecture should look like a good appropriate architecture should be you know neoclassical it should have roman um entablatures and pediments and you know details uh that that would make it true architecture this was just seen as something nothing better than a factory building and so this was not a very popular uh design when it was con constructed actually uh, King's Cross is famous for something else. Uh, for all of you who have read or at least watched the movies, the Harry Potter, uh, you'll know, of course, that there's the famous platform nine and three quarters. And uh, you can still, if you visit, you can um, you can go over to where the brick wall is and pretend like you're going to pass right on through there. So, so I want to compare that to literally next door to, to um, King's Cross is St. Pancras Station. This is from, you'll notice, uh, a couple decades later, 1868. Um, the architect engineer of the train shed is William Henry Barlow, uh, but the architect of what they call the head house, the building at the front where there's a hotel and uh, amenities and ticketing and all of that is uh, George Gilbert Scott. So here is a rendering of the, of the train shed itself. And you can see here that it is even wider. Just uh, 15 or 18 years later, you can see they are now spanning much, much wider than just, you know, four tracks. Now it's, I don't know, maybe, you know, 10 or, or 12 tracks. Uh, so the technology has advanced uh, rapidly. I mean, this is something very much um, indicative of the, of the 19th century uh, the, the the rapid advancement of technologies is phenomenal uh, here's a modern view same view um, they've they've made a lot of changes of course this is actually the um, the station where you catch the Eurostar now uh, which is the train that takes you directly from London to Paris under the English Channel which was completed in the 1990s another major engineering feat uh, for sure, but it gives you a good sense of just how massive this space is, uh, and they're using you know more of a truss-like element, but it is still essentially uh, based on the old Roman barrel vaulted space. But you can also see on the side that uh, it the the side walls that these massive cast iron um, trusses anchor into are masonry. Here's another view of the modern train shed. And just like we saw before, a lot of it can be uh, glazed, just like a greenhouse, and that lets a lot of natural light into the space here. But here's a detail of where these massive trusses uh, anchor into the masonry walls. Again, you, you have a major amount of outward thrust, just like we talked about in Roman uh, vaulting and arches. Uh, you, have to, you have to hold that outward thrust in you know back and so they're using an old technology of massive masonry buttresses and piers in order to hold these uh the ends of these cast iron features from just you know pushing straight on out and again i'll show you another major advancement in that technology shortly Here, though, is the head house, what we call a head house. So this was basically a hotel and, and amenities for the train station. And this was what um, the, the general populace and the architects felt was more appropriate for actual architecture. They did not want to look at the, the industrial character of the train shed like we saw at King's Cross. Um, it was felt that uh, in this case, it's sort of a Venetian Gothic revival style here, that this would be a more appropriate architectural expression. Here's another view of it, um, you know, with arches and details and ornament and all of that, uh, not at all expressing the true nature of the of the train station and the fact that, you know, you look at this, you would not think, oh, this is a train station. No, you'd think it looks like a, you know, a hotel or something like that, which in fact it is, but it's really 
there because of the train station. You don't get any sense that there is a this massive uh, vault behind it. Another example is the Gare du Nord. Uh, this is uh, interpreted as Station of the North. Uh, this is in Paris from 1864, so a, kind of a contemporary to St. Pancras. Uh, Jacques Hitorf is the architect. And we're almost looking at a compromise here. Um, the facade of it is very neoclassical. We see the ionic pilasters and the Roman arches and the entablatures and cornices and so forth. Um, but it at least gives a massive opening, this arched opening here at the center is kind of reflective of the massive uh, span of the train shed that is in behind it. Although ironically, it is not an arched <laughs> barrel vaulted train shed. It's more of a traditional um, a post and uh, lintel type construction just set on an angle for the roof. Uh, this is somewhat problematic, of course, is because, you know, um, you have all these posts in the middle and, you know, the trains can go in between the posts, uh, but now people are walking around, you know, and they have to move around the posts and, and they can kind of get in the way. So. Um, this is also kind of an intermediate technological um, development in that they can still have a very, very wide space, but they're still using quite a few columns on the interior in order to support the, the span of the roof here. Jumping around a little bit, we're going to head across, and we haven't talked about early American architecture yet, but we're going to jump to New York City, which by you know the 1860s is a massive city, uh, not just in America, but in the world. And the, the famous Brooklyn Bridge. This was one of the most prominent engineering feats of the 19th century. How do you connect uh, Brooklyn, which was a major city in and of itself, with Manhattan uh, across the very, very wide East River. If we'd looked at the River Severn uh, early on there, uh, that was that's a creek compared to the East River uh, separating Brooklyn from Manhattan. And it was a team of, of individuals that oversaw the design and ultimately construction of the Brooklyn Bridge in the starting in 1869, but not finished until 1883. Uh, John Augustus Roebling, his son Washington Roebling, and his wife Emily Warren Roebling. Uh, so here's the three of them. Uh, John Augustus um, um, was a immigrant and a, an engineer uh, by training and was a leader in the development of uh, cast iron and especially uh, steel suspension cables. This is a, yet another technology. Uh, steel isn't quite developed yet um, to, to create full sections for construction like we use today, uh, but you could create steel wire. And Roebling uh, was one of those who discovered that if you twist and bind the wire, many, many steel wires together, uh, like you would a rope, uh, you can create something very, very strong, right? Uh, and so um, he, he uh, decided that you could build a bridge and literally hang the deck. Instead of supporting it with, uh, from below, you could support it from above with these steel cables. His, uh, he dies in 1869 uh, after he has essentially designed the Brooklyn Bridge, but before construction can really begin. So his son, Washington, who also was engineering expertise, uh, he takes over the the construction of the bridge and sees it through, except he gets very, very ill partway through the construction. And rather than just having the whole thing stop and maybe not even finish because of his illness, if he were to have died, he didn't, he survived, but his wife, Emily, takes over. Uh, and she was quite an accomplished lady, especially in, in context of the late 19th century, uh, when women were, you know, still expected to be housewives. Uh, she was highly educated. She was a talented mathematician and also learned engineering and uh, was really not just a life partner, but a, a sort of business partner with her husband, Washington. And so when he did become quite seriously ill during the construction, she was able to just step right in and say, okay, we're going to keep going and I'm going to run things and manage this. Um, and uh, really a very, very early example of a woman uh, being heavily involved in a construction project like this. So here is 
the bridge as we see it today with modern Manhattan in the background. In fact, you can even see, uh, what do they call this, Liberty Tower or whatever, where, uh, where the Twin Towers uh, World Trade Center had been. Uh, and this is still, you know, one of the iconic images of, of New York City. And you can see, of course, this is only a little bit of the East River. You can see how massive a span this is. And here we have an historic view, also, of course, contemporary to the construction of it. Uh, and there you get a much better sense of the massive span between Manhattan and Brooklyn. Now, this uses still some of the old technologies of masonry construction. You can see the two massive piers uh, with actually Gothic pointed arches here. Uh, but these are the cables that actually hold the bridge deck up. So we're not supporting the bridge deck from below like we saw at the River Severn. We're supporting it from these cables that span across these massive piers. Here's a section through the, the bridge and it was really pretty, you know, a uh, major um, uh, transportation link. Uh, on the two ends would be uh, transportation for, at that time, horse and buggies, now cars. Uh, in the middle were um, tr uh, train lines for streetcars, now the subway system. And on the very top, at the center, was a pedestrian walkway. And these all still exist. Here's a historic view of the pedestrian walkway after the bridge was completed. And you get a very good view, not only of the masonry pier, but of these steel cables that come out. And there's, there's these giant ones that span uh, between piers, and then the vertical ones hold up the bridge. Here's a construction view of the masonry pier. Uh, uh, Washington Roebling was actually got ill from what's known as the bends. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with diving. Um, uh, the, if, you, if you dive uh, uh, fairly deep and then you come back up, the, the pressure difference between being underwater quite a ways and you know, the air pressure at uh, sea level uh, is quite different. And if you, if you come up too quickly, um, that pressure differential will cause air bubbles in your bloodstream. And air blood bubbles in your bloodstream uh, is very, very bad. And uh, a number of people actually died during the construction of the Brooklyn Bridge because they didn't understand what this was. And they were divers were going down to sink these masonry piers into the riverbed. And they come back up at the end of their day and all of them be sick and they would die. And Washington and Rowling very nearly died from this as well. Uh, now we understand because of this construction that uh, when you do diving, you have to come up slowly, uh, incrementally, so that your body has a chance to adjust to the difference in pressure. I like to show this uh, historic photo during the construction as well. Uh, if you read the sign there, you can see that um, what we now have is OSHA uh, did not exist <laughs> in the 1860s and 70s. Um, and, uh, you know, there, this, was, this was building safety, you know, uh, at the time. I want to show you also uh, Les Halles in Paris, France. This is from the 1840s, finished in 1855 by architect engineer Victor Baltard. And Les Halles, as we see in this historic photograph, aerial photograph, was a massive market hall for central Paris. Um, you know, there, there weren't grocery stores back in the day. Um, you know, people did their shopping by going to uh, like like we do to farmers markets today, uh, but on a much grander scale when you're in a big city like Paris. And so um, they actually tore down a whole chunk of evil Paris in order to build these grand cast iron and um, glass halls where vendors could set up their stalls. And you can see uh, that it's really the same technology as the greenhouses and the Crystal Palace, but just used for a, a different kind of purpose. Here's an historic view um, showing the interior, very similar to the Crystal Palace, but instead of putting machinery and inventions inside, um, it creates you know, spaces where vendors for fruits and vegetables and chickens and turkeys or whatever can, can sell their um, produce. Uh, but it still allows this grand vaulted space here, allows for what amounts to a street uh, so that people can still easily move about through the halls and from stall to stall and even, you know, bring in their carts so that they can drop off or pick up their um, their their goods. Uh, so here's a here's a painting of 
the space, you know, with, you know, women generally did the shopping back then. And so here they are buying, you know, chickens or whatever. Uh, and it was pretty messy, nasty place, as you can imagine, you know, the fish, you know, smelling of fish and smelling of rotten vegetables and fruits uh, would have been quite a pungent um, uh, effect. And in fact, uh, the great, um, writer, French writer, Emile Zola, uh, wrote about this, you know, and, and kind of started introducing this new culture and way of life into literature. And in fact, he even talked about in his book, The Pelly of Paris, which is focused on Les Halles and the markets there, uh, this will kill that. Iron will kill stone. The time is drawing near. I love that quote because it really sums up the, the effect of the Industrial Revolution in the 19th century. But later we're going to talk about the, the counter effect um, to that, uh, which is led by Victor Hugo in his book, The Hunchback of Notre Dame from 1831. Uh, he lamented the loss of what he thought was a true architecture, this you know, stone and handcrafted. And we'll talk about that later uh, in a later lecture. I want to end um, real quick, because I know we, you need to have your quiz, uh, with uh, another exposition. Uh, this is from 1889, and it is hosted by the city of Paris, the French government in the city of Paris. Uh, and they called it the Exposition Universelle. And this is the same kind of thing that the Crystal Palace was built for, a major exhibition of all the great inventions and developments uh, all across the world, and just like before, Different countries would submit, um, you know, some of their machinery and their new technologies, and the, they were radically different from from 1850, just uh, 40 years um, earlier. Here is a postcard view. If you attended the fair, you could buy a postcard and send it, uh, showing you know that you were there. Uh, but it gives you a pretty good view of the massive layout and this famous building here that was built as part of this fair. Here's a historic view taken from a hot air balloon, one of the newer inventions of the 19th century, the idea that you could go up in the air and you'd have a, a bird's eye view uh, that became quite popular uh, to, to have these kinds of aerial images. And here we see this famous tower, I'll talk about that in a minute, and the extent of the exhibition beyond that. It was meant to be temporary, um, um, unlike the Crystal Palace, which survived for many, many decades until it burned down. Uh, the the uh, French, you know, knew that they would just dismantle this when it was all over. Here's one of the views inside one of the exhibition halls, and you can see all of the, you know, the cast iron framing like we had been seeing in the earlier examples um, before. And here's some uh, of those same hot air balloons. This is a big enough space where they could actually have a small hot air balloon, and you could uh, see that technology for yourself. But here's another uh, postcard image taken from a historic photograph of one of the great, this is the, the Gallery of Machines uh, by uh, Charles-Louis Duterte. And in the background is that tower I'll talk about in a moment. But on the exterior here, there was no effort to make this an architectural neoclassical design or neo-Venetian or something like that. Um, partly because this was meant to be temporary and partly because, you know, again, they knew this was a exhibition of, of technology and an industry, so they thought it was appropriate for the buildings to actually reflect that. Here's the interior view of it, and we can see a really, really massive wide space that allows for all this different machinery and inventions and equipment to be installed here on even a grander scale than that of the Crystal Palace, which had to have a lot of columns uh, to support it. Now they have the ability to span really, really wide with these cast iron trusses. And here's a section of that truss, just one half of that. And so it would be pinned at the center point, you know, what would normally be a, a stone keystone. Uh, it would be pinned together there, and then it would come down, and it would literally be pinned down to the ground into a really solid, concrete foundation and a really heavy piece of iron would hold this thing together. No longer do we need heavy stone or masonry buttresses and piers to hold you know, that lateral support. Now it can all be done with iron and concrete.
And if we look at an actual historic photograph, this is one of my favorite photographs uh, because it you can see the massiveness of it, especially compared to the scale of these little people. And all of that load, all of that weight is coming down to this one little point right here. What's not shown is the massive concrete foundation that it is anchored into, but no more piers, no more fine buttresses, all of that is now gone. We have a technology in which it all can come down to a single point. It's, a, it's, a, it's just a massive development in technology. And lastly, I want to talk about that tower. Uh, this was designed and built by Gustav Eiffel. Uh, Eiffel was a French engineer. He had been building iron bridges like we see on the bottom left and the center. Um, two examples, you can see that you know, spans are much, much greater than that of the River Severn that we saw earlier on. So in 100 years, we get, you know, massive bridges. He's also quite famous for designing and building the Statue of Liberty, which was a gift uh, from the Republic of France to the United States in 1886. But his other great accomplishment was that tower for the exposition. Uh, this was really just an expression of cast iron technology uh, and um, going vertical instead of spanning wide. And the idea is that people attending the fair could ride an elevator, another new technology, ride an elevator up to the tippy top and they'd have this incredible vista of, 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 of Paris. Instead of riding in a uh, hot air balloon, which you know was somewhat limited, you could only get so many people, you could allow a lot of people to pay uh, a, a fee to go up to the top here. It was supposed to be a money-making venture. Uh, and in fact, it made so much money that um, that the, uh, the, the organizers, the people who had this, uh, didn't want to tear it down. The French people hated this structure when it was built. The Parisians thought it was a monstrosity. They thought it was ugly and horrible and um, just did not like it. And they couldn't wait for it to be torn down when it first arrived. It uh, was an eyesore on their beautiful city. Uh, but it was served so popular, such a money-making prospect, and people kept coming and wanting to ride up to the top so they could get a great view of the city uh, that it never got torn down. <laughs> and of course, now today, it is, you know, you can't even imagine the idea that they would tear down the Eiffel Tower. It is you know, the icon of Paris, even more so maybe than Notre Dame. Uh, it is, you know, the symbol. You see this and you think of France, you think of Paris. Here is a detailed view, uh, one of my photographs, of the, the just the incredible detail in the cast iron here. And a couple, and here's another view from the underneath. So this is basically a bridge turned on end. So this is a vertical bridge, and this is going to be a great segue in in a couple of lectures coming up here of you know the technologies to build skyscrapers and high rises that uh, essentially emerges out of Chicago. But it's a good way to end here um, to you know finish off the 19th century technologies with a classic view of the Eiffel Tower all lit up of Paris.